Brace, what are you wearing to the Met on Monday? <sighs> you don't even fucking want to know. I do want to know. That's why I'm asking. So you know how right now I only have two nipples, right? And so theoretically, I mean, I have really fucked up like thumb size shit, so I can yeah. fit a lot of piercings on them, but it's really mm-hmm. one nipple piercing each. By Monday, mm-hmm. I will have the udders of two and a half cows. Mm-hmm. On straight up, front front to bottom, top to bottom, mm-hmm. basically down to the beginning of my crotchal area. And each of those will contain about seven to eight piercings each. Combine that with chain mail, full chain mail I'm okay. wearing. Uh, and, of course, those devil shoes. You know, I talked about them on the podcast before. Tabbies. I'll be wearing the devil shoes. And whatever a maxi skirt is. But with the facial makeup of the they them that got fired from the nuclear department for stealing luggage. Mm. So that's kind of going up top, everything down as I described. On my fingers, on my fingers will be what you think are Super Bowl rings, but upon closer inspection, there are Super Bowl rings from Super Bowls that haven't happened yet. So I'm talking 2050, 2062, 2075, Raiders versus Raiders 2. I feel like this is a bit dated. Yes. Yes. Hey, how you doing? What's up? Nothing. Do you know what Monday is? What is Monday? It's the first Monday in May. Okay. It's May Day. Oh, yeah. But no, it's the fucking Met Gala. The Met Gala. What is the Met Gala? It's what the, is... What? It's the Met Gala. Everyone actually a little wait, bit you, Wait, do that. you not know that's what we were talking about when we just did that bit? What is the Met? It's an art museum? You've never been to the Met? No. Why are you saying that proud? I'm not proud. I'm just saying no. I'm saying you petul- should, it's more petulant than proud. Why don't you go? It's lovely. What would I do there? What's there? Both of you it's just tell me to go. A museum. But it's art, art. It's art. Okay. Yeah. I'll go. I'll go next week. I'll go to the Met. Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Now, oh, so you, now I'm planning your week. No. You I need mean, activities, don't me. you? You need activities. I don't planned, need activities. You? I'm already, well, I'm going on Monday anyway. You can't go on Monday. Well, the gala is they have a thing where, like, you don't Rihanna even know what the goes. Theme is. What's the theme? Carl Lagerfeld. No. I'm, I am t- Chanel. Jawman. Is that the same person? No. Carl Lagerfeld is dead. He's perished. Who was the designer at Chanel for a really long time before that? Obviously, Chloe Fendi, also namesake Lagerfeld line. What? <laughs> Chloe Fendi? No, those are two what separate. What a creation over here. Lines. Um, for all our listeners who are not petulant and uh-huh. are interested in what I'm saying. So nobody. Uh, well, that's. You wish. I read the comments. <laughs> um, uh, there's a great book. I don't know if I mentioned it, but uh, it's called The Beautiful Fall. It's about the rivalry between Saint Laurent and Lagerfeld. And it's actually – it's a great book and their relationship was very interesting. And <clears throat> you can actually learn a lot, which is something that I like to do unlike my compatriot across from me whose name is – Bryce. And I'm Liz. Welcome to Drunon. Hello. Let me ask you something. Let me – and Young Chomsky. A producer, Young Chomsky. Talk about petulant. Yeah. Well, listen, <laughs> who is – so Carl Lagerfeld, tall, imposing, oh. scary, homosexual. German. German. Yeah. Okay. Well, then maybe he's not gay. Uh, who is who is the Carl Lagerfeld of today? Who's oh, the scariest guy? But who's the scariest guy that they have in those things? Well, it's different because now you don't really <laughs> – you don't have designers. You have creative directors, which don't get me started on that. I won't. But um, there's, there's. So you th- don't really have the kind of personalities, much like academics. Actually, you don't really have the kind of interesting and complicated and fraught personalities. I mean, they've sort of, um, <laughs> you know, they've designed them out. Mm-hmm. So there isn't one. I don't think so. Is there a room for – you can see where I'm going for this here. Because <laughs> I think that if I fuck with some stuff, physically speaking, on my body a little yeah. bit and other things, like if I like maybe grow significantly, uh, 
I could f- kind of fulfill a Carl Lagerfeld role in today's society. I said this before when we had um, Sarah on, mm-hmm. but Carl Lagerfeld in the age of Ozempic would be so insane. Yeah. I yeah. just like that to me is like, but <sighs> that you, but, is actual galaxy brain like gift. But you think that I, that. but that's what I'm saying is like the, the age of Ozempic needs a Lagerfeld, right? But it just can't exist because he didn't exist in the age of Ozempic. Yeah. Yeah. I'm there just, was this great quote from him because all this like stuff is like coming up now because everyone's getting excited. So blah, blah, blah. And um, <laughs> he was like something, I can't remember the exact quote now and I'm going to butcher it, but it was something like, um, the worst thing you can ever do is buy sweatpants. Like the like when you buy sweatpants, all you've signaled is that you've given up. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, I will say this: I I bought sweatpants, and I gave up on wearing them because I forgot that they exist. I put them in my I, I don't know, there's no drawer I know where to put them in. I put them in my pants drawer. They get to the bottom, and I think mm. I've worn them once. So you need a separate drawer for your sweatpants. But I'm out of drawers. I call them my cozies. Your cozies. <laughs> It's different when women wear sweatpants, though. There's a different connotation there. I'm like putting on my cozies. Um, I, you know, you know me. I, can't I just said that on the radio. I'm wearing my, you know, I'm in full kimono. Yeah, you got it. Day be. and night. Yeah, and I got winter kimonos too. You know, I think that you need. Have you seen those crazy kimonos that are like padded? Yes, I'm that are like the ceremony, crazy I, the ceremonial. Problem, it, the problem is, is that I look too goofy. Like my face is not. A one that's take. the problem yeah you can't like take me i understand i've understood this my whole life is that like i can never cut a imposing I that's the the problem with you wearing a padded kimono is that you look too crazy I, my face looks too goofy you know the padded kimono works if it's contrasted no. with a no. a face that one can take seriously which makes the kimono kind of it like disarms each other if you know what i'm saying mm. but with me is I would f- I, my face would like meld and become part of the padded kimono. Yeah. Like I just know that like I I'm not meant to cut a a, a figure of like that. I just I know what. But I you look. could just get like a nice silk one. A that's si- like a little <laughs> yeah. more casual. Yeah, a casual a casual <laughs> one. Um, what else? Just is- don't go like boho kimono. No, absolutely. I'm the least boho motherfucker. You're. I'm very not boho. You're not boho. I am like anti boho. Boho is bohemian. Bohemian. Yeah. I'm not a bohemian. Um, I'm kind of like a white z way. The way more I think about it. <laughs> but uh, speaking of. <laughs> I thought about that this morning. I was like, they should be, because now the whole thing is like these people doing awkward interviews with people. Uh, that's like the big trend now uh, for like going viral. Okay. And I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go. I, the idea that I have for that. Wait, is, what do you mean like awkward interviews? Like you're just like interviewing someone and they like you say like something stupid. You, they say something like you like kind of like a good. Uh, the classic journalist trick is when you're interviewing somebody is just to never speak. Mm. And uh, and then they, it's like how when you're like interrogating, like a police are interrogating you, they just don't talk and you feel like the interviewee is usually kind of nervous. And so they'll fill the silence there. So you're and saying journalists are taking their cues from cops. Well, I'm not even saying these aren't even journalists, but okay. yes, they're not even, it's just like, it's like viral video people. Like right. I think Barstool has also one cops. fucking the Z-Way thing. And yeah, all these, all these people that you're like, so like, uh, you know, uh, is your dick funky? Mm-hmm. And then you sort of don't say anything after that. And you kind of look at them and they feel forced to respond. Yeah. This is what's. This is what we're doing. We're doing this again. We're not doing this. This is like, yeah, Sasha Vera Cohen stuff. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, we just cycle back around. And um, round but and round and but round I think go. I could I think I could be a good a good white Z way. And speaking of, that's actually how we open the interview. Yeah, <laughs> I've been that's thinking why about it since then. Uh, well, actually, I thought about it this morning. I had a real big idea for it, but I'm not going to talk about it on the show. Um, should we should we get this motherfucker go? We we have with us today a former writer for the Epic Times, the e- Epoch. Well, we talk about that. We talk about that, and we talk about all sorts of other things. We don't resolve that, but we do talk about it. There is no resolution. No, um, or is there? It's a it's a yeah. It's the I I truly not don't until know. time itself stops will there be a resolution. And the epic itself ends. So you know what? Let's hit play on this bad boy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. 
We are doing a Z-Way style confrontation interview with a former writer for the Epic Times, Steve Klett, a poet from Brooklyn. Well, are you from Brooklyn? No. I'm from New Jersey, New but Jersey. now it's, I live in Brooklyn. They call that the Brooklyn. The of, Brooklyn of... The Northeast, yeah. New Jersey. <laughs> uh, I'm just fucking with you. We're not doing a Z-Way style confrontation interview, but we're doing a little uh, follow-up to our Falun Gong series by actually talking to somebody who was employed at the Epic Times, the Falun Gong's newspaper, and uh, has a bit of an interesting story for us. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Wait, I have a question before we start, because we were talking, as we love to do before recording, which none of the listeners get to hear, and you said Epoch Times. Okay. Yeah. Now, what is the correct pronunciation of this, I, of this place? This was a question that even the people working there (laughs) would argue about. Uh, And they they also, from what I heard, had meetings about the meaning of the name. Uh, You're kidding me. Epoch or Epic. And then it's like Times Times. Sure. Um, So like they didn't, they weren't like, the people working there weren't entirely sure. Yeah. Both how to pronounce the name of the place that they worked and what the meaning of that name was. Yeah. Because I think the name was probably chosen in 2001 by a guy who, I don't know, I'm not even sure if he works there anymore. He's certainly not the publisher of Epic Times. Yeah. Now I'm saying Epic. Is no, it, you're saying Epic. Ep- but not, epic. Or Epochs. Epoch. 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 The Epoch's epoch. time. I get it. Time's time. We need to find the unmoved mover of the Epic Times or the Epoch Times, which... Epic. Maybe it's Times epoch. of the epoch? Times. Yeah, Times of the Times. Epic. It's very Greek. Epic. Epoch. <laughs> Epoch. Epochal. Now we're having that thing where the word isn't going to mean anything anymore. What is that? But apparently it doesn't mean anything even to the people that work there. Thank you. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, listeners of the True and On podcast, hop into your old-timey steampunk time machine and go back to the hoary days of 2016. <laughs> the world is so different now. Oh, wait. Now, the world is so different now from then when it was then. Back then, you had Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. Everybody thought, oh, who knows who's going to win? Probably Hillary Clinton. This Donald Trump guy seems like a really crazy guy. And into that whole whirlpool of, um, of you know, capital P politics comes you, Steve. Uh, you got a job at the Epic Epic Epoch Times in 2016. Tell us about the circumstance. Have you heard of the uh, the newspaper before that? No, I never heard of the newspaper. I was kind of just giving out my resume to whomever. Um, I had heard of the Falun Gong mm. through uh, a little band called Guns N' Roses. Chinese Classic. democracy. Chinese Classic. In the song Chinese <laughs> Democracy, <laughs> yes. they go, blame it on the Falun Gong. So yeah. deep. Um, and so I was a deep. super huge Guns N' Roses fan. This wow. is true. I have long red hair. You do. Yeah. Yeah, you do have kind and of a, a vicious temper. Yeah. I would say if you, if you, <laughs> you I, top hat. this is a, well, he is, uh, t- t- listeners, to clarify, he is wearing a four foot top hat right now. <laughs> uh, but uh, I will say if you were wearing like a cut off denim vest kind of thing, your facial structure, I don't want to sound too weird saying this, but your facial structure. Yeah, you do. And if you took out, if you had your hair was just fully long flowing, you could absolutely be a Guns N' Roses guy. Yeah, 100%. In my head, too, by the way, I always refer to Buckethead as Chicken Bucket, which is not his chicken name. Chicken Bucket. And I'm I, always like, oh, yeah, Chicken Bucket. I love, I love Buckethead. Yeah, I saw we can him. all call him Chicken Bucket. It could be the <laughs> epic to our epoch. Yeah. Well, that actually, I'm going to bring up Buckethead Chicken Bucket in a second when we actually get to some of the content you were writing about there or what you weren't allowed to write about. But you were, so you were, you're a young guy, you know, you're on monster.com, indeed, whatever, and you're sending your resumes to everybody. Everybody. And uh, I'd been doing that for about a year and a half. I'd only found jobs at like content farms for PR companies. Mm -hmm. Mm. Um, I'd worked for, a website called Pancakes and Whiskey, uh, where they <laughs> where they sent me to shows in Brooklyn to review the shows, mm-hmm. um, like music journalism. Yeah, and that was all unpaid. And so I was doing, I was juggling a bunch of like internships or like 
precarity. There was right. a lot of precarity yeah. in my life. Well, well, online to... publications like to call internships. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the way I have always like understood it is like people do do stuff like like that. You basically do a lot of free work in order to build up any kind of even beginning level resume. Yeah. Unless you like went to like Harvard or like some like prestigious journalism school, in which case. You can actually start at $22,000 a year at BuzzFeed. <laughs> and I had just graduated from the new school with a degree in poetry. So I was like, mm-hmm. I'm going to write. This is my calling. Yeah, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. Yeah. But you, so you end up in the offices of the Epoch Times. And they were like, we'll give you a salary. And I was like, this is the best news that I've heard in a year and a half. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it doesn't really matter. I mean who it is. And that was my thought, you know, yeah. as long as they're paying me. So where is the office? On 28th Street between 6th and 7th. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And tell me about going there for the first time. Well, I go in there and it's like an interview with a panel. Uh, I had written like a sample article, sent it to them. Uh, and and I did an, 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 a pretty generic interview. They asked me, what kind of news I um, consumed, what kind of, like, do you try to keep a fair and balanced, fair and balanced um, Mm -hmm. objective viewpoint? And um, I was like, yes, and I told him I was interested in learning more about China. Mm -hmm. Um, Always good to have an angle. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, please. Um, And they were like, what are you into? I'm a musician, poet, you know. And they were very, very nice. And that's one thing I want to stress is everybody there was extraordinarily nice. Mm. Like, uncannily so in Midtown. (laughs) (laughs) Like, Like, everybody was super genteel, you know, very kind, soft-spoken, um, and really kind of went out of their way to make you feel good about being there. Mm. And they had said that they were doing, they wanted to be like the Washington Post and do a digital department Mm -hmm. where they got out a million pieces of content and that they wanted to build up this internet presence and that they hadn't had that yet, so... I mean, if we if we think back to 2016, right? I mean, it sounds like uh, it's this sounds so obvious now, but back then, a lot of these uh, these newspapers were basically trying to start their own version of like you know like how BuzzFeed created BuzzFeed News. They yeah. were basically trying to do the opposite by like creating these like essentially content mills to get their shit shared on Facebook because that was like this was like the big metrics era. Yeah, and uh, and that's all that they kind of sold the group as like. We're going to give you the salary. It was like 2500 a month. But, you know, if you're able to make that with the amount of clicks you get, you get 20% of the revenue mm. after, after that. And performance so, bonus. Yeah, performance bonus, like carrot and stick kind of thing. Totally. Uh, and they said, it'll be easy for mm. you to get this. I, I never got it. You never, you never, never got, once it. They, got it. They actually brought me in for a meeting and handed me a piece of paper to – Show me how much of a bonus I had, and it has zero mm. on it. They they wouldn't just not give you the bonus. It, they had to give you a zero bonus. A zero bonus. I mean, I'll be real. I don't think I've ever gotten. I got no. That's not true. My first flower shop I ever worked at, they gave me like two hundred dollars as a Christmas bonus. But uh, that is insane. <laughs> yeah, that's worse than just not giving it. It to was you. it was surreal, and to make a meeting out of it. So you're brought in. You get this job. They're like, we're gonna give you twenty five hundred dollars a month plus. Blah, 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 blah. And you're you're so you're part of basically a new team they're assembling. Yeah. And there's about seven of you, including you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, six or seven. There was uh, one person that was on uh, technology. There was one person on feel good stories, breaking news, crime, um, and celebrity. I think the celebrity writer was the only one that made the bonus. Mm. Well, they got, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. they've got the best to work with. And, uh, yeah, so that was the, they all put us in one room. And here's the interesting thing about this group was that we weren't allowed into the entire office. Mm. We were given a separate key card from what they called the print section. Mm -hmm. So we were digital, they were print. Um, 
And the only time that we interacted with the quote unquote print side was in like the the dining area or the bathroom or all mm-hmm. these things. So your first week there, they give you a tour. They you- give us a tour. And that was when it gets really weird. Um, <laughs> they called it the orientation. We had like a three-day orientation. And they brought us to the seventh floor. There were three floors. The fifth floor was the English-speaking, you know, my, yeah. my floor. Sixth floor was the New Tang Dynasty mm. uh, my television. My Yeah, who you got interviewed for. I did, yes, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and the seventh floor was the Chinese spoken because they both have English and Chinese. Sure. And they brought us in and, and in the back there was like these glass panes that were separating and it looked like a command center with a giant screen of all of China mm-hmm. <laughs> on it. it. It reminded me like a James Bond villain lair. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or like a Star Trek command center, you know, yeah, it had yeah, this kind yeah. of futurism. And they're like, this is where we get the truth to China. This is where um, we break through the Chinese firewall. Mm. And they were very proud of this. Uh, I hate that saying so much. It makes me so mad. The, I like it when they call it the I, Great Chinese Firewall. Oh, my God. Yeah. I just Everyone who says it is so proud of themselves for being clever. It's not that clever. You no. Know, you're just adding a word to a thing that's really famous. So were you, in your head at this point, you're like, damn, these guys love being – they love China. <laughs> like, what do you think? You're like, well, because uh, because you said in the, in the interview, you were like, I'd love to learn more about China. That reminds me of every job interview I've ever had where I'm like, I, you know what? I'm just passionate about bouquets or <laughs> I love boxing mm, uh, yeah. where you're, you're, you sound – no disrespect to you, but you do sound to me like you're lying. That you don't actually, you didn't really, you just wanted a job. Yeah, no, that was it, you know. I I wanted a job pretty desperately at that point. And, yeah. And this was, uh, yeah, a, a white lie, but a, a one that they kind of smiled and nodded and gave me the job. So mm-hmm. I I was like, what did I get myself into? A little bit, but I still had a job. Um the rest of the orientation got a little weird as well mm. when they uh, showed us a video of a Falun Gong practitioner that, like, talked about Tiananmen Square and seeing it and being enlightened for the first time about the truth about the Chinese government and then finding out about all this organ. And we were all like... <laughs> Wait, so you're Sorry. sitting here. Well, I just want to, like, paint a little picture here. So you're sitting here with other people in this orientation. You're like, I got this job. I'm so stoked. I graduated college. Now I'm, I'm going to, like, be a journalist. I got a job. They're paying me. This is so exciting. And then you find yourself sitting in a room watching a video about the, like, truth of the horrors of the Chinese government who are harvesting the organs mm-hmm. of – like spiritual protesters in China. Are you just like, what the, f- where the fuck am I? Well, th- they presented it as this was our founder and we're, you know, this is where we come from. This is how we started, but we're not that anymore. Mm. So was that, was that Li Hongji that they were showing a video? No, of? it wasn't. It was somebody who kind of defected. Oh, like, okay. Yeah. yeah. It was somebody who realized that it was shot in a very like early 2000s way too. Yeah. And they Which, you know, pretty that's cool. It, it felt like it felt like a elementary school like when they wheel in for substitute yeah, teacher. Yeah, 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 you get the TV wheeled in yeah. on the big yeah. See kids listening these like, days, they don't know about that. Out. Condoms. That's how I watched 9/11, <laughs> 9/11 happen. Yeah, yeah. 9/11 on the big, definitely. They yeah. Really wheeled that TV in. Well, I was technically in a helicopter, but um so you you you're like watching this, and you're are you're like cohort because there's seven of you, right? Tell me about them. Who the fuck are these people? They were just local New Yorkers. Most of them <laughs> hadn't had a job really, like um, in life. Yeah, like like me. Like it was very first job. Kind yeah, of yeah. Thing. Young people. Young people. Okay. They were all in their twenties, um, pretty much. There was one from, I think, Crown Heights, mm-hmm. one from Staten Island. Oh, real classic mix. Uh, one from 
uh, Manhattan. Oh, uh, wow. They're really, it's like the United Nations over there. Yeah, it's every borough. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what a classic smattering. In my head, it's like some one guy in a Knicks hat and then like one Hasid yeah, and then like yeah. one. Well, a Chinese the, guy that's not in the Falun Gong. Like one like traffic cop. <laughs> yeah. The, the, guy from, <laughs> the guy from Staten Island would show up on a, on a, on a motorcycle. So sick. Yeah. So sick. Wow. With a with a helmet, he'd be like the coolest guy. He was the crime. He would go and do cr- I found his LinkedIn. Oh. Yeah. Very cool. So your duties are what? My duties were to write five articles a day um, over the course of eight hours. Mm-hmm. And they would feed me articles or I would feed them articles to run by them at the beginning of the day. And then by like 9, 30, 10 o'clock, I would have a meeting with uh, Jasper Fokker, whose last name Quite is name. great. <laughs> um, I just, I'm going to let that one go for a second before we return to it in a bit. I'm slicking my hair back. <laughs> it's, it's a little too much. Jasper Fokker. Yeah. Oh, man. I could tell you stories about him. He was so much fun. He had like a bouncy ball, and he had he did all these funny things. What What are you doing with your face right now? Yeah, he he had like a scratchy beard, and he compulsively he would just mm. itch. He would rub his yeah. chin a lot, a lot. And so this was this was, he Jos, Jasper Fokker was a member of the Epic Time Epic Epoch Times yeah. management. He was he was the editor, like the editor of our group, and mm. he was he was uh, if I, judging by the name, a white boy. He was Dutch. He was uh, th- you can hardly be more of a white boy than a Dutch. <laughs> he, he always talked about his thatched roof that he grew Are up. Are you kidding in. me? No, I'm not. These fucking Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> These fucking reddier Dutchmen he, when they're thatched would, he roofs. Would, he would talk to me. He'd be like, you know, no one time like, New York was Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, that that he would like. He would, He's probably coming up to you being like. Let me show you some commodities. Yeah. Let me uh, show you my vases. Tulips. Right? God damn. Fuck out of here. So wait, and so but 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 my point is is this was a a funky white boy Dutch, reddier Dutchman thatchier thatch roof uh, Falun Gong practitioner. Yeah. And did you did you because I, I mean not to do a reveal here but. Everybody who was in any kind of management there, or really, it seems like basically everybody but you yeah. and the people you worked with, like the seven, six, six, six or seven of you, was a member of Falun Gong. Yeah, and that was not apparent at any point until much later. <laughs> like they weren't doing the exercises in the offices or anything? They would put blinds over some of the rooms, and if you like peeked in between the line, blinds, you would see them doing the exercises on like lunch hours and stuff. When uh, did you realize that you were that everyone was a practitioner? Mm, only only when I met my ex, really. Mm. Um, it was very obfuscated and they kept all of the practitioner stuff in the print side and we weren't allowed to go. Oh, I see. There. Like you didn't even talk to those people or anything like that. Well, we would run into them in like the on lunch hour mm-hmm. or one was my editor, uh, Henry, who was Australian. Um, and we oh, got some chi. <laughs> yeah. Dutch and Australian, Dutch, Australian. There was one woman who was from New Zealand. Um, they're a bit friendlier yeah. there. Um, yeah. And everybody else was like Eastern European. Of course. Canadians. Lots of Canadians. There this is what go. I'm talking about. Lots they, of Canadians. I can I'll get I, I have such a the Canuck, perfect. The Canuck loves a funky diasporic fucking, organization. Yeah. Like yeah. whether it's like a Ukrainian like Galician division or something like that, or like a freaky cult from somewhere, they totally. they, they will join it. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 they always have like Australia there's always connected to Australia. Somehow. I would always try to it's talk about with. Rush with them. That was my in. I uh-huh. was like I know I know one band from Canada. What band? Rush. Oh, Rush. I yeah. think you would try to talk about Russia with them. No, I would talk about the band Rush, the greatest <laughs> Canadian band of all time. Neil Peart. No, wow, you really are living up to the way you look exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you really can judge a book by its cover. Um, no, actually the greatest Canadians, Avril Lavigne. So let's 
talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you were writing for them because, it, like, did it start out where you – like, how did you find stuff to write? Because I'm trying to understand, like, the mind of the, the clickbait artist, which – you know, 2015, 2016, this is when that the, yeah. that form kind of comes you, into its own, You guys it feels were gods, like. um, I mean, did you, was there stuff that you knew to be, like, what they were looking for? Or were you trying to write stuff that you wanted to write? Or how were you approaching the work, like, starting out? Well, they had one of these aggregators that you would see that mm-hmm. were, like, what's trending now. Mm-hmm. And I'd look through that, and they also gave me editorial guidelines, which was part of the orientation. Mm -hmm. A man named Stephen Gregory came in and told us we weren't allowed to talk about um, modern music. Interesting. Only classical music, which I later found out was only Shen Yun. Mm -hmm. Oh. Um, And... Interesting, they call that classical. Yeah. Yeah. Stretch. (laughs) Um... (laughs) Uh, nothing about drugs, okay. um, or really sex, organized religion, and sexuality, LGBT. Mm-hmm. They called it not family friendly, which uh, was a real kind of code word. Yeah, real dog whistle there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they said have a clear mind around uh, Muslim Islamic terrorism. Have a clear mind. Have a yeah. clear mind around Islamic terrorism. <laughs> yeah, that was the. <laughs> I, I'd love to know, like, what is the fuzzy mind of is around Islamic me, terrorism? Me, you texting a girl at three a.m. Hey, have a clear mind about Islamic <laughs> terrorism with a bunch of M's. I'm well, a little I, like, oh. I did push back during this, and this oh. this is one of my favorite. You're like, what if I have a muddled mind about Islamic <laughs> terrorism? <laughs> yeah, of two minds. I, I pushed back, and I was like, what if it's a white guy doing terrorism? Mm, classic rejoinder. Yeah, uh-huh. and uh, Stephen Gregory said there's never been one. <laughs> Just in general? Wow. Yeah, in general. That is erasing uh, thousands of years of work <laughs> by our people. There's been so, – wait, like just in general? Just in general. in the world? And, and somebody else brought up uh, Dylan Roof. Sure. Because uh, it just happened. Uh-huh. And, <laughs> yeah. And – we're doing the time travel. Um, and and he said that didn't have an ideology behind it. It was what? just a lone wolf, uh, an individual, but not like Islamic terrorism. I What? It doesn't okay. make a lot of sense. I just, um, I, it just seems weird to me because like there has been a lot of. I mean, it's a classic like fascist defense. Yeah. Like, yeah. There's no ideology here. Yeah. It's yeah. just uh, individuals doing individual things. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And it, um, and then later on, so I went to the bathroom later on. Classic. Uh, like two hours after this meeting. And I'm, I'm by the urinal, and Stephen Gregory is in the stall. He's d- taking a dookie. Yeah. He's taking a shit, and he's uh-huh. sitting there. And, he uh, and I'm sitting, I'm standing there at the urinal, and he goes, um, like from the depths of the stall, and he goes, I thought of one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh. Wait, who was it? And he goes, Timothy McVeigh. <laughs> that's the one he thought that's, of? That's the it one. It took him that long to yeah, think of that? He must have been stewing over this question. Yeah. And what about I, Ted Kaczynski? Yeah. That's like a pretty famous one, Erasure. Too. Yeah. Uh, Maybe you didn't consider the him great, right. The great. The great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what? I kind of don't either. <laughs> and, um, I, and I said, you know, look what happened to him. And I walked out of the bathroom. But, you know. I want to. I want to. I, I know we're interviewing you <laughs> about this like your experience so quick. very curb your enthusiasm feeling right I want to be super clear on something to our listeners right here. Never under. Any circumstances, no matter how close you are to somebody, don't speak to them while you're pooping. That, <laughs> I find that to be super distasteful. Co-signed. Yeah, it's yeah. Young Chomsky has co-signed that. It is just Liz curiously hasn't, but it is. No, uh, I just I, I don't know that this needs to be said or is like I is froze. This a thing I needs? froze. Yeah, I mean, I, this I, is my boss yeah. talking to me from the depths. And his pants, his pants are down. 
Yeah, his pants are down, and he's thinking about yeah, all the— Yeah, he's in a the, vulnerable position. The yeah. white terrorism. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. So you're like, all right, well, I can't write about music. So you're like, well, it's Rush's out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't, I can't, uh, I, you can't write about drugs. I presume in a non-crime context. I, I, I assume the man from Staten Island could write about drugs. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. Like positive drug activism, I think they would look at it. Yeah, like, so like you couldn't be like, they legalized weed in these states yeah. or whatever. Um, but what was your actual – so you were like basically looking at these aggregator like – was it like a program? And I would choose like a center-right topic, like mm-hmm. the safest – and I was the politics writer, and so I would choose like the safest – blandest story. I think I did one early on about Gary Kasparov. Oh, yeah. The chess player. Speaking of time travel. Yeah. He doesn't believe that uh, time is real, really. Hmm. And not in the way that you or I would perceive it. I think he believes... I can't remember what the... It's like a certain... There's like... It's kind of like a cult in Russia, but uh, Gary Kasparov is one of the more famous adherents to it, although I think he denies it now. But they basically believe that, like, history is only, like... 300 years old. Yeah, he mm. wrote a bunch of books, um, too, like The Winter's War uh-huh. against Putin. Like, he's a, you know, one of those... He's like, a dissident. An- yeah, dissident, anti-communist, uh, and they love that. And he's a gamer, too, chess, yeah. which is... Sure. Which is world championship going on right now, following it. Mm. Go China. Um, and I did Pete Rose, you know, these kind of... And, and it was like, Trump wasn't the nominee yet, so it was kind of that primary like is ted cruz gonna Mm. come back because i kind of read it not as a trump group but as like a evangelical um center right organization that had a heavy religious kind of we're not going to talk about controversy but also we're going to be pretty right wing about everything yeah. yeah. And you told me when we spoke before that their big thing was they would tell you, you got to be objective. And we yeah. don't want to be like these New, York, these New York Times, like liberal kind of people. Yeah, I found a quote from Jasper when he told me, we're not like center right, we're center center. Mm. So, dude, that's, that's true <laughs> right there. Yeah, <laughs> center center podcast, right? Yeah. Wow. So you were like, uh, I'm. I, were you like shut the fuck up like I just need to do my five articles a day yeah I was like whatever uh, I'll write you know because it made it easy because Trump was always tweeting stuff at that point when he oh, was yeah, back sure. tweeting things and every tweet was like an article I could write so most so of you were them. done by like 1pm yeah. every day <laughs> I had to I had to make it seem like I was doing work yeah 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 so what happens you know in the office when Trump does get the nomination uh, they switched me. They mm-hmm. switched me over because at this point I was working both the Democratic and the Republican. Ooh, like a true center center. Yeah. I, I went to a Bernie Sanders rally mm-hmm. and they uh, admonished me for not saying uh, socialism led to 100 million people sure. dying. Sure. Um, R.I.P. Um, yeah. You know, pull but <laughs> but uh then they moved me over to full time Trump. Mm-hmm. I <laughs> they were like, you know what, you're our Trump guy. You're our Trump guy. They uh, sent somebody to follow the Clinton campaign, mm-hmm. um, you know, like, digitally. Thank God, I'm not yeah. <laughs> she campaign. she was languishing for a story every day. Cause yeah, literally, they did nothing on that campaign. She should have doubled as a nurse, and perhaps she could have really joined the campaign. Oh, when she. When she stumble, stumble, falled. Yeah, Hillary Clinton was in the throes of death for like three months of that campaign. She was not doing well. It was probably one of her best the fame articles. Was On 9-11. Yeah, yeah, my 9-11. It was hot out. It was 70 <laughs> degrees that day. So were you following Trump? I was watching every one of his rallies mm-hmm. from the office. So no is the answer. No. Yeah, but you were— They didn't were, have the money. <laughs> they <didn't laughs> they weren't paying me enough to go follow Trump. Yeah. Um— but you watched all his rallies. I watched all his rallies, yeah. um, and I did go see Trump once uh-huh. at the Waldorf Astoria mm. for the economics. Some, it, it was one where I got P- Pence and Trump. Mm. Pence was the opener. Trump was wow. the real charismatic duo there. Yeah, mm. um, and like 
Don Jr. was in, mm. and it was all these like so very wealthy, like upper west side people that were sitting on the floor and then all the journalists up in the upper like yeah tiers so you're following him and did the epic times epoch times tell you to like they're like all right this is our guy or was it like pretty hands off well they made they were pretty hands off to our faces but i like when i went to that um not rally but speech um the guy that I went with, who was very interesting, Valentin Schmidt, he um, was a cross-eyed, uh, or he had one lazy eye, and he was German. Mm-hmm. What a what a character! He was like a real crypto crypto guy before you crypto. You want to be a German named Schmidt? No. Yeah, and no. he 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 jumped up. He jumped up and started clapping at everything mm. when Trump was doing it. And he was the only one of the journalists. Mm. Like all the jo- journalists, even like the Fox News people were like stoic. I was sitting next to one who was playing like golf on his phone. Like they were all bored because they'd all seen Trump. I was next to the BuzzFeed guy too. He was But there. not Valentin. He's, not Valentin. He, he was, was enraptured by. Yeah, by tax cuts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because they said the tax cuts thing in the whole place like, goes lit crazy. Up. Goes crazy. That was his stairway to heaven, mm. really. Um, so, <laughs> but, but you know what was not his stairway to heaven? He got booed for the child care thing that really? Ivanka was pushing at the time. Mm. I don't even remember that at this point. Yeah, he got he got a real he got a real poor reception from the elites of New York mm. for the think, old welfare state. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like socialism, he's a nanny, of course. Mm. Uh, so, but the uh, but you're like we're not we're not we're not talking about like the editors coming down and being like, listen, you need to like put more pro Trump stuff out. No, um, and I think Jasper might have mitigated that. I think that Stephen Gregory was trying to have a more heavy handed. I'd see some of his like fixes that he'd wanted, and he's like, oh, why aren't you putting in more like about the murders and rapes at the border. But, like, they never ended up editing any of my stuff with that in there. Mm-hmm. I just was privy to some of the changes that the ideologue wanted. But, no, it was, like, even-handed. They didn't really want um, to talk about his impropriety too much. but No sex. Yeah, when they came out... Um, and all those women accused him. I watched that. It's tough to watch, but like they didn't want me to cover it. Sure. So it was. It wasn't like pro Trump, but it was like let's shine the lens away from the negatives of Trump. Yeah. So what happens next? Well, the election gets closer, um, and the office gets weirder because I. Um, met my ex. I started meeting um, somebody in the office, having an office romance mm-hmm. with one of the practitioners uh, I, from the other side. So to be clear here, by practitioner, you mean a member of Falun Gong? Yes. And so tell, tell us about how that came about. What happened there? We, we met on a lunch break and, you know, we started chatting um found out what she was she was an illustrator she was from italy um and she'd come into the falun gong um and they brought her in um on the print side and so that was really the time that i got enlightened to what was going on on the other side and she would kind of feed me information by the other side, you mean the print side. The print side. Yeah. Which she would call the compound because they didn't really have she any. She called it the compound? Yeah, yeah. they didn't have any, mm. uh, like, windows. We had these large windows looking mm. out at right. FIT. Um, but, like, the other side was, like, very low light. Mm. And so you meet her in the lunch room and you're like, hey, have you ever heard of Rush? Yeah, <laughs> and she's like, "No, I haven't." No, but what happens? Like, um, we 
talk about music and what kind of music we like uh, and philosophy and all. That's one thing that I noticed about all of the practitioners here was that they kind of all had these pseudo intellectual kind of pursuits, mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, a lot of them were right wing, but some of them were like left liberal kind of thinking. But yeah. so we're talking. Um, one of the other practitioners had two extra tickets to see the Icelandic band Sigurós. Mm -hmm. And I was a big fan of Sigurós. And so he sold me those t tickets. And like after some talking to – I asked her to come to the show. Mm -hmm. And so – You asked her on a date. Yeah, I asked her on the date. And that was in a month. So then we had this kind of like, we got a month so we can s get to know each other mm -hmm. before the date. Mm -hmm. And within that month, she and I like meet for lunch. We meet for coffee. Um, and I tried to meet up with her on the weekends, but she kept saying, I have to go in for work. And so she was, I found out she was working six days a week and they were bringing her in like seven in the morning, every morning, uh, and leaving six or seven at night. Um, and they would do cultivation sessions in the morning. Can you explain what that is? Uh, best I could understand was that it was a group therapy kind of, we're going to read from the book of Lee Hongji, mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about kind of the tensions in ourselves, kind of like, you know, kind of like a Dianetics. We're oh. going to soothe our bodies by talking about it with other practitioners who are cultivating these anxieties. Mm. And I walked in on these one time at seven in the morning and they looked very like it was on the print side and I was not allowed to go there. Um, but I would hear that she was working these hours. She was also meeting up with her boss and fixing his motorbike. Okay. Um, and he was bringing her around to, like, um, get ice cream, gifts. I think she went upstate once. I don't know if it was Dragon Spring, but I know that she went upstate. It's probably mm. Dragon Spring. It's yeah. probably the, Dragon the Spring. The compound that... And so yeah. was, I found it very difficult to, <laughs> like, meet up any other sure. time, um, which then led into one of these times talking to her, and she revealed that she wasn't getting paid. She wasn't getting paid at all. She wasn't getting paid at all. So they were having her work six days a week, do these kind of ritualistic cultivation sessions. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't getting paid. She wasn't getting paid, and she was here on a vacation visa. So she did she think she was going to be paid when she came here? She, no. She, she came here with the belief that they were going to give her a job later on. Mm. So like, oh, well. The like, internship. Funnily enough, actually not too unusual. That, that arrangement is not that unusual in digital media or in the media, but... They so they brought her over here with the promise of a job if she did some work for the she basically interned for them. Yeah. What she ended up doing is working six days a week for how many hours a day would you say? Like ten to twelve hours. Ten a day. to twelve hours a day uh, with a no money. How did she have any money? Um, they put her up in a place in Jersey City where I then found out everybody lived. Everyone from the office. Everybody from the office except for you. Except except for the non. The non practitioners. I see. And they all lived in this one giant apartment. I, I, I never went there, but it sounded like a complex or just a large apartment building with a lot of studio mm -hmm. apartments and stuff. I mean, you compared this like a little bit to Scientology, but it's like, I mean, when we were doing the. Um, Doing the little series on Falun Gong. I mean, I kept thinking about Scientology. Maybe yeah. it's because I'm from California, but like, mm -hmm. there are a lot of. You know, similarities. Yeah, and she was very stressed and distressed by mm. all of it because she seemed like she wasn't comfortable at all in the living situation in Jersey City. And they were running her ragged. They weren't giving her any work. She was brought on as an illustrator, but it seemed like she 
didn't do anything. I think she did some formatting for the newspaper. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it seemed like the people on the other side, according to her, were just sitting around. Like Uh, all day. uh, Yeah. Mm. So what um, you you mentioned to us, I mean, you mentioned to me prior when we we spoke, and then you mentioned to us before we started that she had actually – was someone had tried to uh, marry her her first week here, and that you found out that actually almost everybody in the office was right. ha- in these sort of weird marriages to other people. Yeah. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, that was one of the most uncanny things about being there and realizing everybody was paired up, and suspiciously everyone seemed paired up between an American and a non-American. Mm-hmm. She w- wasn't proposed to by American. Uh, she was, I don't think, but it seemed like everybody else had these almost arranged or loveless marriages because none of the people that were paired up seemed like they were married. They just were complete mismatches. They were not affectionate. They seemed like at best acquaintances mm. and, uh, then they would throw these green card parties. I got, like, they would throw birthday parties when it was somebody's birthday, but they had an even bigger party for when somebody got their green card. Mm. Interesting. And Henry, the, the Australian editor, um, like, they all came in. Like, everybody came in from the print side to the, to the digital side and just gave him a cake when he got a green card. Mm. And, His wife was there and everyone else was like similarly paired up. And I imagine they were seemingly looking for green cards. So, so yeah, I mean, it seems like the implication here is that the office was filled with people who had essentially married for citizenship so they could come over here and work in the the Falun Gong organization. That is the implication. I'm not making that as an accusation. Yeah, we're not. Listen, to be clear here, we're just kidding. (laughs) <laughs> All this is just we we got an AI. Steve's not real. No, they're they're doing this in Minecraft. Exactly, they're marrying yes. each other in Minecraft. <laughs> Actually, that uh, defense is no longer uh, <sighs> that doesn't work anymore. Guy just got arrested uh, <laughs> after making a threat in Minecraft. Um, but uh, so it's just like this is part of this like sort of basically this this scheme allegedly to get people probably to get them. Yeah. How does a cult bring people across borders? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's almost cliche yeah. to say, but it's, you know, terrifying to witness and to realize you're in the middle of, because uh, I had that realization shortly after she told me all this, mm-hmm. and that it seemed like people in this creative department that she was a part of, this was a regular thing that they were bringing interns over who had had similar experiences, mm-hmm. and that they were bringing these women in who would later be denied visas. So are they all women? Uh, yeah, at least the two that her and the other woman mm. before her. Gotcha. And yeah. they would have rotating, like, every three months they'd bring in somebody different. How did how did she get into, because she's an Italian woman, um, how did, how, do you know how she got into Falun Dafa? Um, she approached one of those tables and was like, you know, what speaks to me is these gruesome pictures of organs being removed from people's bodies Mm -hmm. and then buying the book. And I think she told me she cried when she read the book. It was the first time somebody had really spoken to her in a spiritual way that Mm. connected with her and that she was, you know, started doing the, you know, exercises um, and felt better. So then she got into the wonderful culture that they have yeah of the yeah of the Falun Gong of the Falun Gong um and yeah I mean she she would do the exercises on a regular basis but she was really confused by everybody at the epoch because she's like what practitioners are racist oh like she didn't understand like the American conservative element to it yeah and and she was confused. I mean, I'd say she was a liberal social democrat, like a European yeah. liberal social democrat. Um, 
and she was totally confused by the conservatism mm. by people saying that like m- Muslims were an anti-American conspiracy, yeah, or yeah. that immigration should be like separate, like people shouldn't mix, yeah, you know right. that kind of stuff that you brought up in the previous episodes. Yeah, they think crazy shit. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. I was like, can you separate it? <laughs> Cuz she was always making a distinction between yeah. the practice, you know, and the teachings right. versus the people that did it mm-hmm. who were corrupting. And mm-hmm. I was like, can you separate it? I think a lot of people, you know, have to do that in order yeah, to that, keep Yeah, that that's generally something you hear from people in uh in organizations like that, that if if somebody gets caught doing something flagrantly, you know, against whatever you know, the supposed teachings of the organization, oftentimes people will be like, "Oh, yeah, but that's people that like that's the corruptness in, in man or whatever." Yeah, right? it's not the, the religion; it's the yeah. person that's not doing it correctly. Right, right, right. So you're in the office, you're like, okay, all these people around me are seemingly in arranged marriages, and this cult is acting a lot cultier by the day. You're, like, kind of getting inundated with stuff. You're you're just constantly writing about Trump. Yeah. Like, what is your mindset in all of this as it's kind of it, – because it feels like it's getting a little crazy. Yeah, it was, and it, it really made me – paranoid and to be around everything when they brought me in they brought me in and they told me to stop talking to her Mm. they brought me in and they were like we've heard some complaints about you talking to this practitioner and it's distracting her from work and it seems like it's distracting you from work and I found out later they'd said a similar thing to her Mm -hmm. Um, and that's when I was like, they're monitoring me, they're surveilling me, mm-hmm. like every move that I make is being like, you know, I felt like a goldfish or, you know, being constantly, yeah, just being watched. And that was, that was pretty terrifying. And I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I should like quit. Um, I wanted to see the election through um, because I'd been doing it so much. But, you know, what could I do? I just, I stopped, like, using their messenger service. I stopped really seeing her around the office, um, stopped talking to coworkers as openly as I had been. Mm -hmm. Um, It was a very anxious time. Yeah. That's a good tip, though, just for people listening at home. Never say anything on the in-office communique. No, 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 no. No, no Google no. Chats, no Slacks. Well, they use their own. That, yeah, no proprietary they, software. What's the Epic Times inter-office messaging system they called? They used one called Unseen Messenger. <laughs> really? Which, which... That That's just supposed to, like, fake you out? Someone else had done a deep dive, and it was originated with a far-right like white nationalist kind of really yeah 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 the software they use the the software like the person that started it was linked to like nazis or whatever what is it the clear view guy what the clear is it the clear view guy i i would have to go back and look at it but it it, it boggled my mind Mm, you know after after i got let go from them which we're, we're we're heading to that but um how much of it was so linked to this kind of Reddit, <laughs> like dark web, far right. Yeah. Even the software in there was mm. linked to a far right group. So this month goes by. You you bought tickets to this uh, Sigur Ro- I've never actually said it, the words out loud. How do you Sigur pronounce Rose? it? Sigur Rós. Sigur Rós. Sigur Rós. Epoch, epic. Epic. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I, what I, Icelandic? It's like, I don't know how am I supposed to pronounce that. You know what I mean? Um, but you bought these tickets. She's like, had she, is she familiar with the band? Yeah, she loved them. Uh-huh. 
and you guys are like, we're gonna go. You spend this month. You're getting. You get called in in that month, presumably, and they yeah. tell you to not talk to her. Yeah, five days before the concert. And they do the same to her. They're like, don't talk to this month. Yeah. Uh, you still go to the concert. Rene- Renegade, a maverick, mm-hmm. going to the concert Good together. Good for you. Yeah. Was, and how was it? It was great. She said it was the uh, first time that she'd done anything in New York that she wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I still haven't had that happen to me yet. But um, <laughs> and it was it was you guys had a nice time. Yeah, it was it was a uh, yeah, it was great. It was a great time. Um, and subsequent, you know, it was in Radio City Music Hall. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a s- spectacular show. Well, what happens next? What happens next is we sort of continue seeing each other sparsely and outside the watchful eye, um, but then they, they basically fired the whole team at the end of the month. So what month was this? October 27th, they fired. Right before the election. Right before the election. The why 2016? Did they- what? 2016? Yeah. Now, why, to your understanding, why did they do that? The official reason that they gave us was there had been cuts in the journalism yeah, yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That I uh, love telling people that. Lots of, lots of, I mean, it's uh, happening. you know, NBC, Washington Post, they're all uh, cutting some of their mm. labor. Belts are tightening. Yeah, belts are tightening. It's not, it's out of our hands. Um because was your was your <laughs> I was just gonna call it your posting, but was the, the <laughs> pieces that you were like churning out for them? I mean, were they doing well? I mean, was it getting the clicks and stuff? That... There was there was one that did well, uh, and they put it on the front of the newspaper. Oh, yeah, it's uh, it was it was also picked up by Alex Jones nice. in, in Infowars uh-huh. on the TPP. Mm. Uh, and I did this like Clinton is in a bind between Sanders and Trump for the TPP, mm. and like these both these, you know. Compete. Oh, the Trans Pacific Partnership. Yeah. Oh, okay, I thought TPP when you said that. I was like, oh, this is like in some conservative wire service. But I remember the t- Trans. Yeah. That was a big deal during the election. Mm. It was a big deal because Obama had sort of gotten the ball rolling, and it was mm. like his baby and. Like Trump was like no TPP, and uh, and San- Bernie Sanders during the primary no TPP. You know it'll send too many jobs overseas. Um, and I I wrote this article how Clinton was having a difficult time managing all this, and that that got really picked up. That was the mm-hmm. only one that I heard that did really well in the entire time I was there. Mm -hmm. Um, But it just seemed like they wanted me for these print newspaper kind of articles, but the digital side, from my standpoint, completely flopped. Mm -hmm. None of the articles really did what they wanted. They had such an exuberance, uh, or it was more like an abundance of articles that, you know, People weren't clicking on single articles yeah. as much. They were oversaturating. They, they were the oversaturating yeah. the market, and it was so much more difficult for any one article to get any, you mm. know, clicks that they wanted. Mm-hmm. And so it was confusing. Um, it didn't seem like we were doing much, and I was just trying to do another dollar, another day kind sure. of thing, trying to get to the election. I thought, you know. And then they blue balls me on the election so bad. <laughs> a, week bu- a week and a half before, mm-hmm. they let the entire team go. And Jasper Fokker, I'll never <laughs> forget sorry, this. It's still very funny. I wouldn't be able to it's, forget that either. He cried. He cried? He cried. He, he cried? They, they, so brought us, they, they, <laughs> they brought us in and, and they let us all go. And they're like, we'll give you, you know, the unemployment. This isn't our choice. And then... As we're like getting all our stuff to to leave, Jasper starts crying and like hugs me. Oh my gosh! <laughs> He's like, I thought of another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you're you're out at the Epic Times, and yep. you're just like, what the fuck just happened? Yeah, what happened? 
Yeah, uh, it, it's still confounding. If anybody could tell me why we got fired then, I assume it was because they wanted to go full Trump, which they did immediately after. Yeah, I was going to say that that co- coincides with their like really the epic times becoming kind of what it is today, this like conservative powerhouse media organization. Not just conservative, but Trump. Trump like, specific, yeah. Trump specific, uh, QAnon ish. Mm-hmm. Uh, Very much so, like yeah. 5G coronavirus, get the facts. Coronavirus. Uh, did you see their, uh, they had a documentary they made about? Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was great. That jo- was their big one. I remember they were pushing that. I think that came out in 2020. It was like that and Plandemic were like in the same, dropped yeah. in the same week. Yeah. Joshua Phillips, the guy, the guy that was, did that, what a fucking asshole. Mm. I hated that guy. Um, he I would walk into like the, the lunchroom or in the morning and he'd be eating his breakfast and reading like Machiavelli. So corny. <laughs> That's so tight. That's such a cool evil guy thing to do. Be yeah. reading but Mach- like as a freshman. Yeah. Just like cool evil guy freshman. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I yeah, that would be stupid if someone did that when they were 33. Um, <laughs> Nobody does but that. But you get fired. You get fired and you're like, fuck. What happens with you and the girl? Well, her vacation visa ends on November 3rd, and it's like a real will-they-won't-they they kind of situation. And it, like we, we had the last night that she was in the country. We got together with other people in the office. We did all of the—this is the funniest. We did all of the most cliché— Italian things, but Americanized. We went to Artichokes Pizza and then to like gelato. Oh my God. Then you cat called and wrote on a moped. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And then we you shared one single strand of spaghetti. W- yeah. And then, oops. Well, we went to see, uh, like, we we're like, okay, I guess we're leaving and never going to see each other. Let's go to the movies. So we saw Inferno. Uh, the Tom Hanks movie. I oh my god! Wait, the, of the Da Vinci Code. The Da Vinci I Code. Really? Heard of that. Yeah, which Dan is Brown. set in Florence. So it was like. Oh wow! Go, so you're doing a ta- more all Italian. It, all Italian things. Yeah, classic Italian movie, Inferno, mm-hmm. not the Argento, but actually the the Tom Hanks one. Yeah, the Illuminati. Yeah. yeah. So. Then, as the movie ends, we walk out. And it's like, I'm going to Brooklyn. Uh, do you want to come to Brooklyn? Mm. And she's like, you're not virtuous enough. Oof. And so that's what she told me. <sighs> that is, I mean. That's rough. That yeah. is stone cold. <laughs> and then I left. And I expected never to see her again. But, um, you know, time passed. We kept in touch. And I ended up going to Italy uh, twice mm. to see her. Yeah, you guys actually dated after yeah. that. Yeah, Like real dated, right? Well, long distance dated, and then yeah. uh, I, I went I went to Italy, and we went to like Florence, Venice, Milan. So did her, and I mean, I don't know if I call it practice or how I refer to it, but like did her uh, Falun Gong beliefs, did, that, did it survive the internship or whatever we call it? Yeah, and she did what I was talking about, where it was those were the bad people. The Americans, Epoch, yes. Epoch Times, the Epoch Times people were mm. the fascist um, uh, cult, right. and the Falun Dafa was still the way, sure. and they were not practicing it correctly. They didn't, they were stupid, they had, you know, as she said, like, little minds, Um <laughs> She was pretty, and and we had bonded over how much we despised all the people in the office. So. No, that's always a good thing to bond over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then that eventually, you guys stopped seeing each other. Yeah. I uh, first time was good. Second time, classic. Yeah. yeah. And so how now you're just like, I mean, what? It's 2023 now. You're looking back at this and you're just like, what the fuck was that? Because that seemed like it took up like, no, I mean, yeah, obviously you worked there in 2016, but then you sort of had this relationship that like came out of that. Right. And there's just a lot there for you. And I and after that, I wrote an article mm. in Medium yeah. talking about um, 
having worked there. And I, you know, it was kind of a liberal article at the time. <laughs> like it was in response to the Mueller um, Russian troll farms. And oh, I kind yeah. of compared my experience to the Russian troll farms and how how much of the Trump campaign was simulation, how mm. much was uh, real, how much of a campaign really was there. And that got that got everybody calling me. <laughs> yeah, I, I I ended up getting calls from NBC, New York mm. Times, uh, ABC in Australia, wow. uh, Vice, all the hits of the Vice news, news all my favorite Speaking of layoffs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, layoffs. The worst, the worst interview was with Vice. <laughs> really? They brought me in for two hours and talked to me and and argued with me about my own politics. What do you mean? Like I was like, you know, I'm. Saying uh, whatever you think. Yeah, saying, you know, I'm a, you know, I, I was with this group, but now I'm a commie. And they were like, how can you be a commie? Yeah. And then the entire interview was about that. Uh, would you have any, this is sort of, I guess, kind of not related to the rest of the episode, but to any of our listeners who, if anything ever happens to them and they get interviewed by a bunch of people, do you have any tips for them? Uh, don't trust them. Yeah, yeah, huh, fair enough. Like I don't trust you right now. Cause hey, <laughs> well, we're you're, this is your words, motherfucker. Um, yeah, we're literally recording this. Yeah, but, but that, we could edit it. That's true. Yeah. yeah, you can make me sound like I'm Paul Deman. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so looking back on, like you know, in that piece you wrote on your on your blog, you you were talking about how you're basically comparing yourself to a bot. Like, do you feel like you were a bot? Or how, what do you? Like, well, how do you it was look like the. It? it was like the Cambridge Cambridge Analytics kind of thing mm-hmm. that had come out, and it, it was simply for clicks and simply for messaging. And I don't know that I was necessarily a bot because I had a brain, but I I had to suppress a lot of feelings I had uh, about things in order to get the content what they wanted. Mm. Like, I like had, what feelings? You know, about Trump. Mm. Like I had to write about Trump in as neutral way as possible, mm. which is a fucking skill that I uh, got quite good at. But mm. in order to do that, you had to like, you know, suppress a lot of the stuff that he was saying. Like pick and choose yeah. and see, kind of like see what you needed to see from what he was saying because that's what you needed to write. Right. In order to create the commodity that ended up being this thing that they would then sell Mm. online. Did you feel like you were able to kind of like keep separation or did you find yourself like falling into it? No, I was completely detached. Mm. Some might say alienated from my labor. Mm. Um, And that persisted. I had to keep this kind of high level... Uh, I'm me writing about this, but I'm also me inside thinking like my else. things. Yeah, I yeah. know what you mean. Yeah. Did and that, like, fuck with you? All the time, but it was also made everything funny. Yeah. Yeah. It, That's, <laughs> that, I will say, like, that is that is the mindset when you're in a weird situation like that, is you really just have to think it's funny. It, and it was all funny. I yeah. mean, all the characters, you, you, you know, you... It just becomes a story that you tell yourself. And and eventually it was more like, how much do I want to ride the story out? Yeah. Um, like I want, I want I'm doing this, this for the story, which I'm telling you right now, mm-hmm. uh, because of my ability to detach myself from my, you know, job that I needed to get for rent. And yeah. Stuff like that. But not everyone thinks of journalism like that right and so a lot of the pushback i got because i was like writing this article kind of saying that journalists are all propagandists um and it doesn't matter how neutral you think you're being you're still doing propaganda for capitalists and a lot of journalists who interviewed me took issue with that Mm. i can imagine journalists can be very precious about uh, their craft. About the truth. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's the thing that was nakedly true about this job 
was they believed themselves giving truth to people. And it was so obvious that it, it was a distorted truth. Yeah. And it was through this bias and lens. And I couldn't, you know, how, how can you separate a truth of a situation from the bias and the ideology that, you know, filters the information? And so, yeah. Well, I think that's something that I always, I, you know, it's, it's, when people sometimes when people talk about journalists and uh, and they 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 almost describe in this way as like these people are like very cynical and crazy and some some are absolutely but I think genuinely a lot of people even if they are what what you might see as like pretty blatant propagandists uh, genuinely do believe in what they're doing and believe it to be true and believe themselves to be upholding what they what they think are you know virtuous principles. Um, and I mean, this is a, this seems like a pretty good example of that. Like, I don't know if any of the people you work with would have this cynical take on, like, yeah, we're basically we're part of this crazy cult that, you know, hopes Trump will overthrow the government of China or some, and we got to get him, uh, you know, elected by any means. No, they will, they will, they will. Well, that may be the truth. Uh, they sort of have to not even self deceive at all, actually, but just like you know, filter that through this these these various like hats that they wear. Or not hats, but... but, but well, we masks. all repress certain things, and we all, like, have to compartmentalize certain things yeah. out of our lives in order to keep going, whether it's, like, the shit people at Epic Times who aren't the real practitioners or... You know what I mean? Like, I think you can say the same thing about probably... I mean, I think everyone does that, you know? But I do think that you're right, that journalists get very touchy about it, specifically because of the nature of their job, and I think also this, like promise that I think a lot of people are like f you know fed a little bit of like y you know the 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 like ethical imperative of like truth and journalism yeah. or whatever and that being this kind of like um you know like white hat or something and when you kind of expose it for being you know, more compromised or more, like, contingent than people want to admit, it gets really, you know, people take it personally. I mean, understandably, but, you know, maybe they shouldn't. And Trump did a lot yeah, to reinforce this. Yeah. Sure. This journalism activism. Yeah. Because suddenly he's banning people from, like, that was the thing with the BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed got banned from going to Trump rallies and then brought back in, and it was this whole, like, uh, freedom of the press is dead under Trump um, kind of yeah. thing that rallied the troops of journalists. Right, right. And, and it, it's, it's frustrating because I did a lot of um, interviews afterwards about this with journalists and constantly coming up against this wall because mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed with... NBC for that article. That big ben, piece. Ben Collins. Ben and Collins. Brandy and Brand Zandrazani or whatever. Yep. I got I got to meet them and this is this is a fun story as well. I I had all these like all this evidence of mm -hmm. labor trafficking that I wanted to and that ended in their those questions that they yeah. ended up sending to Stephen Gregory you referenced in the last episode. And I had all this evidence. I had this these kind of anecdotal evidence of her being labor trafficked and me going to 30 Rock and, and walking out of the subway stop and it's Fallen Daffa Day. Mm -mm. There, and it's the sea of yellow shirts just walking towards me. Yeah. And I see, who do I see there? Valentin Schmidt. No shit. The, the German Nazi dude with, and he was like walking towards me. I'm like, they know. <laughs> as you're going in to as get I, interviewed by as these I'm two going people. into what I think is a whistleblower kind of like they're yeah. trafficking people in. And I get up there, and they're like, well, it's very hard to prove. Mm -hmm. And they ended up just asking me, well, you know, was it a Trump propaganda outfit? I'm right. like. It is, but also there's, there's more, there's more yeah. to the story. And then New York Times, similar. I get called up by New York Times. 
I tell them my story. They're like, well, it's very hard to prove and we can't go on the anecdote. ABC Australia calls me, does a phone interview as part of this three-part documentary. Um, and they started, as it's coming out, the first part comes out and practitioners start picketing ABC. Yeah. Uh, like outside their offices. Um, and then she calls me up and says, they're cutting your section. Like hour, an hour before the lawyer went through and cut like 50% all of the labor trafficking, all of the, um, I guess, controversial anecdotal stuff that I have from my experience and they cut it mm. out of the final piece. And she's like, I'm sorry, I wanted this in, I wanted to discuss. Yeah, yeah. And they cut it from her. No. Yeah. It's like even in that instance, all anyone wants to talk about is Trump. All, yeah, all they wanted <laughs> the to do. The whims of the market. Nobody Across wants, the board. Nobody wants to talk about VPNs. We didn't talk about that yet. But. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, I, 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 I think we feel like we mentioned it the last Hong Kong episode we did, but yeah, the VPN business that they have. Ultra with, uh, surf. Family. Ultra yeah. Surf and Freegate. There, w- there were some articles about that, though. In, in, I think there's a Daily Beast one. Um, but it's just so funny because it was like even their own, like, boosters had to be like, yeah, no one really uses this. Yeah, nobody, you know, I'm not saying that they're being sold for any reason Yeah, to a bunch of alphabet people. Well, there, that, that <laughs> article is Li Hongji, a CIA agent, which, by the way, is a little deceptively titled, but it's like an academic article. Yeah. Uh, I think mentions uh, maybe NED, yeah. some, like, funds they were, they were spending on that stuff. Right. Um, but, yeah, um, but we have to wrap up. Do you, is there anything you want to plug or anything? Yeah, I, I'm trying – I'm getting a podcast – uh, together called Lost Futures, a Mark Fisher podcast. Mm-hmm. My friend and I go through every essay by uh, Mark Fisher. Our first season is going to drop, hopefully, when this comes out. Uh, we're doing Ghosts of My Life, first season. Second season will be Capitalist Realism. If you want to check out my writings, I'm on Medium. I write a bunch of philosophy articles about music, movies. Uh, I got interviewed for a Good Charlotte podcast. Hey. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, this is sort of a... Yeah. We, you have to let us know when that airs because we can't air this within three months. Of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's much bigger than this podcast. Um, GC Generation. Wow. Yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a crazy idea for a podcast. <laughs> Well, we'll definitely link to all of that in the notes and point people that way for sure. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Big fan. I've been a big fan forever, so this means the world to come on. Oh, thanks and so all much. my friends yeah. out there that love this podcast. Well, shout out to your friends, too. No. Yeah. Fuck you, Steve's friends. <laughs> Are you a bot? Am I? Uh, no, I'm more like an NPC. <laughs> um, to me, I'm kind of like, I just, I, sometimes I feel like I take the microchip with the old current thing out of my brain out and put the fucking new current thing in. Damn. Yeah. That's crazy. It's just, it's just how I am, baby. I'm just, I'm one with the times. Are you a bot? Yeah. Okay. That's really going to change my perspective on the way we do the show. I thought you knew that. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I, this is my bot voice. It, that's not a good bot it's voice. It's not a good bot. But why are it's, you judging my bot voice? That's true. I'm sorry. This it's, is my bot my voice. My bot voice. Wait, what's the TikTok voice? I can't do that. I can't imitate that. I think they stopped doing it. I gotta tell you this. What is wrong with your TikTok? I have so, not uh, commented on the like several recorded screenshot things of videos of your TikTok that you sent to the group chat. You guys By the way, that we I have not asked for that are like horrifying. You what guys are you wanna, looking at? I, I'm not looking at. I've never. No, you're I, feeding info into the thing, and I'm it's not, giving you this. I don't bag. search. I don't use TikTok like at all, and so I everything you don't I use sh- it at all, and yet you log in, and then you. Send I us log these, in because I like every time I've, videos. Every time I've logged into it it's like all right there's a guy in a hole eating worms 
It's all the live ones. The videos are just, I mean, you know what but I look like. But why are you seeing that? Uh, I don't know. Dude, look at what I saw. This You actually don't even want to see this. I don't want to see I'll this. show Young Chomsky. Here, you know what? This one's actually horrifying. This no. was today. This is this what I want to see. This was this morning. I, oh, and I couldn't even post this one. It's a hydrocephalic baby. And it's on live. It's like you're, you're recording hydrocephalic. You don't look. It's. It's a cranial, oh my God. but like, yeah, and it's it's like on TikTok, on uh, TikTok live. That's what I'm saying. It's not. The, it's the live videos. It's all people in holes eating worms and the hy- hydrocephalic. But babies. you realize that you've given the algorithm information that it is what possible combination? I'm asking you. I'm sorry. What possible combination of things could I add no. together that shows me a hydrocephalic baby? Grace, this is a question you need to ask yourself. Why would you put, you have your hydrocephalic you baby me? on the little baby bed and then you set up your ring light and the camera next yeah, to it? Fucked and it's fucked up. Fuck, it's awful. I've but, never, that video, but, I've, I'm inured to a lot. Not I fucking, think maybe you should start searching other things so you don't see this I do, Dude, you should, the actual videos it shows me is just Alex Earl and Taylor Swift. That's the actual videos it shows me. Well, then you need to stop looking at it live. I can't. That's the only reason I look at it. I don't want to see the other stuff. Okay, so we're circling back around here. It, yeah, we're the guy in the hole eating worms. It was a, a, a there's a you could torture a dwarf by donating it money. It plays a loud noise while it tries to sleep. I don't know, man. I, I don't want to see these things. I and yet you are. It's not my fault. Uh, there's nothing I could have. There's nothing. I don't want to. I genuinely don't. I did a screen record it, but I don't want to see that. I couldn't even post that on my on the to sh- my showcase saying, of the TikTok's things. TikTok's not showing me that. What's well, maybe you're not looking in the right places? All right. You also, do, you know, you don't even know what hydrocephalic is. So how would you know it if you saw it? I'm Liz. My name is Brace. Uh, normal cephalic, but hydro. Everything else. And we are, of course, joined by our producer, Young Chomsky, and the podcast is called True Anon. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>